Hey everybody, welcome back to Recordology. Okay, guess what? Records are a wonderful format. I love them. I love them so much I started this show. But are they the best audio format? Absolutely not. That honor goes to the compact disc. Don't believe me? Check this out. This is Recordology. Okay, guys, we're not making this argument from a sentimental perspective. This is purely a technical argument. And from a technical aspect, CDs are far superior. Now, what's this all about? I thought records were the best out there. It was premium analog sound. That's what everybody says, right? Well, that's what they say, but as oftentimes the case is, they're completely wrong. A record of any type, any speed, is a flawed, flawed media. Why is it flawed? Well, there are a couple of reasons. So you'll see that it's circular, it's round. So when the stylus goes through the groove, it is going to be experiencing centrifugal force. So if you're on a merry-go-round and you start spinning it fast, you start being flung to the outside edge. Well, the same thing happens with the stylus. When it's riding in that groove, it's having more pressure on that outside edge which is the left channel, the left groove wall. And so it's really hard to balance the audio between both sides and to get an accurate representation. Next, when the record speed. is rotating the and the needle is on the outside edge, there's more media passing under it versus this inside edge when there is less media. So the record is actually spinning slowly under the stylus here than it is here, even though the record itself never changes speed. So the amount of plastic that is used to describe the groove is more so on the outside versus the inside. What does that mean to you? It means that the sound quality is better out here than it is in here for a couple of reasons. One, because there's more media passing under the stylus. Next, because this groove is spinning in a tighter circle in the middle. Both of those combine to give you higher fidelity in outside versus the inside. The Beatles actually had a lot of infighting about who would get the songs on the outer groove versus the inner groove. Sound quality is much better. Here's a little trivia fact. Back in the days of radio when they used 33 RPM 16 inch discs, the fidelity even back in those days was noticeable from the inside to the outside, or I should say the inside to the outside. So what they would do is if they had a radio program that they were playing back, that started on the outside groove and ran to the inside, the next record would start from the inside and run to the outside so that the fidelity would match. Ein revolutionierend neues Musiksystem. Philips Compact Disc Digital Audio. If records are flawed, then why does everybody say vinyl's the best, it's the premium sound quality, it's what audiophiles use? Well, there's a couple of misconceptions. Part of it is your understanding of digital. Now, as you know, a CD is digital. Well, kind of. Actually, the human ear cannot perceive digital audio because it's just a series of bits, of ones and zeros, and you cannot perceive digital sound. So when you listen to a CD, you're listening to analog sound. The CD player uses what's called a DAC, a digital to audio converter, to convert digital information back into analog. So both of these are really analog medias. However, this one keeps everything digital until the very last second before you hear it, whereas this and tape do not. They contain the analog information from start to finish, thereby introducing hiss, crackles, distortions, etc. Now is a really good time to bring up something that you're already thinking or you have heard, surely. And that is that records sound warm and rich. Well, actually, that warmth is distortion that you're hearing. That is an inherent distortion or coloring of the audio that the record provides. Now, some people like that. They like the warmth of it. Same thing goes with tubes. Sort of like tube amplifiers sound warmer. Those are distortions. So in actuality, those are, are not good things. However, you can like them and that's fine, but just understand what they are. A CD will give you much more flat audio, meaning that it's not being colored in the same way that a lot of analog mediums do, like warm records. Der Compact Disc Spieler ist sehr einfach zu bedienen. It's time for a little bit of Digital Audio 101. We're gonna debunk a few common things that you probably don't realize. So. First of all, there are two types of digital audio. There's compressed digital audio and there's uncompressed digital audio. Compressed digital audio would include streaming like MP3s, Apple Music, 8-track um, 3, 
which is actually the format that many discs use and others. So this is the compressed digital world and we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uncompressed digital means that you don't lose anything in the process of storage and that's where the CDs are. In terms of compressed digital audio, there are two types of compression. There's lossy and lossless. Lossy compression would be MP3, AAC, any kind of streaming format, even 8-track 3 is lossy. Lossless compression would be Apple lossless and others that compress the audio but you don't lose any quality in the process. How does lossy compression work? It's very interesting. So let's use this sine wave to represent analog sound. The human hearing has a range of about 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000 hertz, meaning the lowest frequencies of 20 hertz is as low as the human ear can hear. These are bass low sounds. And the highest pitch frequencies are 20,000 hertz, which is up here. However, sound goes way above and way below what we can hear as humans. So we're hearing this range and sound is occurring at these areas right here. Now, analog sound captures all of this data. However, they figured out through what's called psychoacoustics that we can figure out a way to get rid of a lot of this information because it takes up storage. So, we're going to clip off the sounds that you can't hear. Then, if there's repeating sounds, let's say a certain note is hit right here and then it occurs again right here, we're only going to store the data for this piece and just replay it right here. Now all of this happens in real time really, really, really fast, but it's a combination of tricks to keep you from understanding that you're hearing less than the original audio has to offer. Other tricks include masking sounds. So if there's a super loud area where there's say a drum hit, and at the same time there was a quiet flute passage, they just get rid of the flute passage because you can't hear it anyway. Now, like I said earlier, CDs are not lossy compression. In fact, they're not even compressed at all. They are pure digital audio, uncompressed. So how does it work? So let's say you have a sine wave again. This is sound. This is the lower frequencies. These are the higher frequencies. So this is the range of sound that is being played or recorded if you're recording to digital. So how do you convert this analog waveform into digital sound? Well, you take samples. So each one of these dots that I'm drawing represents a sample. Now what the system does, what digital audio does, is it goes through and records just those dots. It doesn't need all of this information. It just takes those dots and records them in their corresponding position where they were in relation to the original sine wave and all it takes are these samples right here, then the digital audio converter, the DAC, converts it back into analog sound. Makes sense, right? By doing this, you eliminate a lot of noise, a lot of hiss, and a lot of static. So here's some interesting things you need to know about CDs. Es besteht kein mechanischer Kontakt zwischen Platte und Abtastsystem, denn es wird optisch abgetastet. CDs use 44.1 kilohertz sample rate. That means for every second of audio, let's say from here to here is one second. Okay, that's one second of audio. It is sampling it with those dots 44.1 thousand times. So as you can tell, my previous chart was a gross simplification. It's going to capture so much detail all along the way here that it's going to be able to very, very accurately recreate that sine wave in such a way that it's going to be rebuilt and played back for you in excruciatingly high detail. Also, CDs are 16-bit depth. So what is bit depth? So if you take the highest point and the lowest point and think of a visual of a million little steps here, not a million, many little steps here. Um, 16 bits 
represents how many times, how many placements there are vertically for those dots to go. Because if you were to zoom in very, very carefully and look at that, it may pick up right here, it may pick up right there, and as you can see, those aren't directly on the line. So when it's reconstructed, there can be little errors. So the more placements, the more steps vertically that there are here, the more accuracy there will be in placing those dots, in placing those samples exactly along the way. Uh, so 16-bit is what a CD player uses, and that is about 65,500 different values. So two to the power of 16. So we're talking a lot of depth. Now you've heard of 32-bit, you've heard of 64-bit. Um, those are higher bit depths that can be used for audio mastering and whatnot, but in the course of playing back audio, you cannot perceive the difference between 16-bit and 32-bit as an example. So we all have heard audio that is 8-bit audio. We're thinking like Nintendo Entertainment System audio. Um, you think of like this blocky digital sounds. So people don't really understand that those sounds that you hear when you hear 8-bit audio is actually more about the amplification, the cheap wiring, and the cheap audio processing versus actual bit depth. If you were to take high quality audio that say was CD quality 16-bit to begin with and down convert it to 8-bit, it wouldn't sound like Nintendo. It would just sound really noisy because what happens is the noise floor of the audio is increased with a lower bit depth. So let's say this is a range of human hearing, okay? Now there is something called a noise floor, which is where the noise comes up to a certain level, which you would hear as tape hiss if it's an audio tape, or even you know, the noise of a vinyl record. So with 16-bit digital audio, that noise floor is below the range of human hearing. With 8-bit audio, it's not. So the noise floor is kind of up here. So what you would get is you would get, you know, a little bit more, more noise floor, but you really wouldn't get that, you know, 8-bit sound. Now, you say, well, 24-bit, 32-bit, that's better, right? Well, the human range of hearing hasn't changed. It's just that the noise floor is even lower. So that doesn't really help you out because it's already lower than the range of human hearing at 16 bits. So by going to 24 bits or something higher, you're not really getting anything except that noise floor is even more imperceptible out of the range of human hearing. So even at 16 bits or, like I said, 65,500 resolution steps in describing that waveform, there are very minuscule errors. But those errors are corrected through processes such as dithering and noise shaping, digital filters, etc., etc. So again, this technology is a lot more advanced than you probably gave it credit for back in the day. Die geringe Größe der Kompaktdisk, ihre Unempfindlichkeit gegen Staub und jegliche Abnutzung. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of quality compared to records? So, if you take the bit depth, you can understand that there is a direct correlation to dynamic range. And if you do that, you're going to understand that a 78... The edge of the record is carefully polished. After this is finished, comes a listening test, when the record is actually played for expert ears. Has approximately 30 to 40 decibels of dynamic range. That translates into approximately 6 bits as it compares to CD audio, which is 16-bit. An audio cassette tape, very similar, 40 decibels of dynamic range translates to about 6 bits. So, where do our beloved vinyl records come in? How does this compare to all of this? Are you ready for this? So, a vinyl record has approximately 60 to 70 decibels of dynamic range. Okay? That translates to, and you're not going to like this, only about 11 bits. As you can see, a vinyl record has much less dynamic range than a compact disc. This is the technical side of things. Now, if you were to take a CD in comparison, let's go ahead and pull that aside there. A CD has approximately 96 decibels of dynamic range. Okay? Keep in mind all these other ones we've talked about. We've started 30 to 40 decibels with 78s, 40 with tapes, and moving onward 60 to 70 with records. 
but CDs have 96 decibels of dynamic range. That is the lowest low, the lowest quiet to the highest loud and how much you can perceive that in relation to that noise floor. That translates to about 16 bits. Not about, exactly 16 bits. Now, if it's put through its paces, CDs can push a dynamic range of way higher than 96. It can go up to 140 decibels of dynamic range if it's managed properly. So as you can see, from a technical perspective, CDs are far superior to vinyl records, tapes, and 78s. We never realized just how good we had it back in the 90s. This is such a superior audio format, I can't even begin to tell you. And we're not even talking about Super Audio CD or other variations. Okay, so here is a compact disc. You've seen it a million times. How does it work? Now, a record is stamped. You know, they take an actual stamper and they press the plastic, the PVC, to have this image that we play back. The biscuits, cooled for easy handling, come off the belt in neat little piles. But before they are used for actual pressing, they must be heated again on steam tables. Then I saw a record pressed. First, steam is shot through the machine. Then cold water runs through to cool the record. And it actually is done very similar in a commercial pressing plant for compact discs. The metal layer, which is actually on the bottom, this is sort of a sandwich which is such a thin sandwich it's impossible to perceive by looking at it. But if you look at the back here, so this is a screen printed label, and on the bottom side of that is a shiny reflective surface. That shiny reflective surface is usually like an aluminum, like a thin metal, and that is actually physically pressed and stamped so that those pits and lands can be read. And I'll show you how that works here in a minute. So that's you know the basics. Then there's polycarbonate and other layers as well on there. So how about a CDR? Now look at this, here is a CDR. You'll notice it's a different color. Uh, this CDR is green, as all CDRs are. Unlike a regular CD that is physically stamped at a factory, a blank CD or a CDR isn't really stamped. You don't really have physical pits and physical lands on a CDR like you do with a regular CD. So how does it work? When you burn a CD, a CDR, it's just changing the refractive capabilities of a layer of dye that's in that polycarbonate. So similar to the sandwich of a CD, the sandwich of a CDR has a dye layer rather than an aluminum layer. What happens is the dye is burned and changed to different refractive properties so that when the laser reads it, it perceives it in a similar way that it perceives a physical pit or land on a compact disc. Whew. This is a lot of information, guys, I understand. But once you understand it, it's actually really, really fascinating. So one little thing about CDs I wanna tell you. So you've heard of you know binary code, ones and zeros, you know the language of digital, including what you're watching now is just a bunch of binary dots, a binary code that's translated from ones and zeros back into video and audio that you're listening to and watching. Well, it's a little bit more complicated with that. So the pits and lands in a CD don't translate one for one into ones and zeros like you may think. It actually is even more complex than that. The CD laser diode is actually projecting light onto the surface of the disc and depending on whether it's a land or a pit, it refracts that light back up in one way or another. And then that is converted into a one or a zero. But what's confusing about it is it's not one land or one pit for a one and a zero, it has to do with sequences. So there is actually sequences of when it comes from a land to a pit and if those happen in a certain order and a certain speed and a certain number of occurrences, it becomes a one and a zero. It's even more complex than you can imagine. I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible, you guys. My mind is about to blow up just, you know, trying to force myself to think about it. Now, unlike a record that spins at a constant velocity, a CD actually changes speed the further it gets out onto the disc. When the laser is at the inside area of the, of the CD, which is where the music starts, where the program starts, it's spinning at about 500 RPM. But as the laser gets towards the outside edge, the disc actually slows down, I bet you didn't know your CD player could do this, slows down to around 200 RPM. That's because the pits and lands are traveling by the laser at a different speed 
when it's on the outside versus the inside. So in order for the CD to be read properly, it has to slow it down in order to get those read so it doesn't come across too fast. Because a CD player is playing in real time, it's not storing data like a mini disc player does. Now, Harry Nyquist started working on the digital theories and whatnot that would lead to compact disc and other digital forms all the way back in 1928. But it took until 1982 before Philips and Sony brought the CD to market. And by the way, you can thank Philips for coming up with the name Compact Disc. Here's a peek behind the curtain, guys. This is my main audio system. What does it consist of? Well, up here, I've got a very simple and basic but beautiful four input multiple output mechanical switch. This is literally mechanical and it works great. One thing you won't see here is a receiver. So what else do I have in terms of audio equipment? Up here I've got a beautiful Pioneer dual cassette tape. It's plugged into the tuner, um, so I have to turn that on first. But it does a great job. It's only got Dolby B and C. It doesn't have Dolby S, but it does a fantastic, fantastic job. $10 at a garage sale, no joke. Below this is probably the most professional piece of gear in this stack. This is a Kenwood quartz synthesized AM FM stereo tuner, the KT89. But this is a big fancy radio is what it is. But it is super sturdy, very professional uh, quality construction. Does a great, great job. Now below this are my CD players. Let's take a closer look at that. This is the newest addition to the collection. This is my Symphonic five disc CD player. Symphonic is a value brand. It's actually made by Funai uh, Corporation, which, trivia fact, was the last company to manufacture VCRs all the way up until, I think, 2016? But this is a 1998 uh, era five disc CD changer. I got it for $15 at a thrift store, and uh, it was a little rough. I cleaned it up, um, did a little bit of lubrication and cleaning, and now it works like a champ. Surprise, surprise, I got a lot of Glenn Miller in there. Uh, the resolution on this one is not quite as high. The signal to noise ratio is not quite as high performing as this unit right down here, which is the main CD player in the setup. This is a Sony DVP S7000 from 1997. This is Sony's first DVD player, and it also happens to be a fantastic, fantastic CD player as well. I love how this panel comes up and down and you can control things with it in the up position or the down position. Um, and there's the drawer as well. This uses a separate laser for the DVD player and the CD player and it's actually considered an audiophile grade transport slash CD player. What's a transport? It's a CD player without the DAC. So audiophile, people who like to spend a lot of money will buy a separate DAC uh, than the CD player itself. This is just a CD player. But anyway, it's got a separate laser for the DVD than the CD, and uh, the quality uh, resolution on this one is superior to a regular you know, entry-level unit. These originally went for $1,000 a piece. I got it for $8 at the Goodwill. Okay guys, that was a lot of information. Thank you for bearing with me. But as you can see, I've proved conclusively that CDs are in fact way better than vinyl. However, I still love vinyl. Vinyl is great, it's exciting. And even though I'm not gonna give up CDs, nor have I ever completely, um, vinyl is a complete different animal in and of itself and very, very exciting. Ultimately, whatever you're listening to music on, whatever you're enjoying is the best format for you. I've now proven conclusively that a compact disc is infinitely better than a vinyl record. Like I said earlier, from a technical perspective. That being said, I love records, they're awesome, and we'll continue to do this show all about records primarily, with a few other formats thrown in there as well. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Happy record hunting and CD hunting. We'll see you next time.